Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Facilitating European Trade and Compliance webinar. We'd like to thank you for being here today and thank you for trusting in UPS to deliver this important message. Before I introduce our speakers today, um, there are just a few quick administrative updates. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and the recording and presentation will be made available to everyone who registered after the event. Uh, we encourage participation and would like to ensure we answer your questions. Please make use of the Q&A function at any point during the call. Uh, we will try our best to answer the questions live on the call through the Q&A function, or if necessary, we will contact you privately after the call. And please be on the lookout for a post-webinar survey after the webinar has finished. My name is Natalie Warren, and I'm the Brokerage Marketing Analyst here at UPS, and we have a great lineup of speakers today, including Penelope Nas, President of International Public Affairs and Sustainability at UPS, Walter Vandermeer, Director of UPS EU Brokerage, and Ron Shepard, Director of Customs and Trade Compliance at UPS. For legal purposes, I'm going to read the following message verbatim, and then we'll get started with today's great content. This presentation is for informational purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice. Please consult your own legal counsel for such advice and do not rely on this information without performing your own research. And with that, I'll hand it over to Walter to walk us through the agenda. Walter. Thank you, Natalie. We will start this webinar with topics that cover regulatory changes in Europe that you need to be aware of. With the import control system release two that covers safety and security requirements, we need to implement a system that will affect all shipments that are shipped to the EU. The EU VAT system is being redesigned, which affects the way you do business with EU companies. The above changes are based on a desire to make the EU stronger, to protect EU citizens against terrorism, to increase safety and security, and to reduce tax fraud so that important revenue streams that are uh, required to finance the union and the member states are being secured. Russia sanctions, the Ukraine situation, Northern Ireland issues are driven by geopolitical factors. But they also affect your supply chain. The overview will enable you to learn about these changes in order to adjust your supply chain to comply also with future changes. However, we're also going to look further. We're going to put these changes into a wider context and talk about the broader scope, the future of trade, so that you can look at a changed supply chain and make strategic choices where necessary. We will cover the report of the Wise Persons Group as well as global trade trends and transparency in the supply chain. Let us start right away with the import control system release two. After 9-11, governments increased their focus on safety and security. In Europe, this was done by implementing the import control system. It allowed customs to screen data prior to arrival in the EU. Although the system was deployed for all transport modes, it had a major flaw. The risk assessment was performed only when the goods were already moving. That is why the European Commission introduced new legislation, which is commonly known under the name ICS2. ICS2 is the European Union's attempt to secure the supply chain in order to protect its citizens and the single market. The system is being rolled out through different releases. In release one, deployed last year, express carriers and postal organizations filed declarations with a limited data set to customs prior to loading. And you can compare that to ACAS in the US. The major objective of that release was to find the bomb in the box. In release two, scheduled for the 1st of March, 2023, 
Also, general air carrier cargo will have to submit data prior to loading. And as from March 1st, 2024, rail, road, and maritime movements will be subject to ICS2 requirements. ICS2 requires global postal and express, freight forwarders, air cargo, and airline operators to file preload as well as pre-arrival information into EU systems by the 1st of March, 2023 for risk analysis by the customs authorities. UPS are focused and preparing for this change involving the supply of an HS code online item level, an EORI number and further data elements. And I will explain these requirements a bit more in detail on the next slides. What is sure is that this endeavor involves many internal UPS functions, as well as you, our customers. So we have put the who, the when, and the how on this summary slide, so that you know that all goods transported by air in postal, express, and general cargo consignments will be subject, in addition to preloading filing requirements, to complete pre-arrival ENS data, which stands for Entry Summary Declaration Data Requirements. Important to know is that UPS is fully synchronized with the legislator. We're talking to the European Commission and the member states, and we are prepared for a successful launch by the 1st of March, 2023. To supply of an HTS code online item level and an accurate goods description become key data requirements. And UPS is expecting no impact on service upon condition that we are provided with an HS code and an accurate goods description. Let's talk about the HS code and the descriptions. In order to avoid unnecessary delays to your shipments, you need to provide us with plain language descriptions that are precise enough for custom services to identify the goods. So obviously what is not acceptable are standalone numbers. And you see on the right, the examples, file extensions, three or more equal symbols or letters, empty characters, special characters, or special characters with numbers. That may say something to you, but not to our customs brokerage experts or not to customs. So let me give you a couple of tips and tricks. These tips and tricks will make your life easier, our life easier, and it will be good enough for customs with the result that your shipments will be seamlessly customs cleared and released. Question one, what is an accurate goods description? Well, it is a detailed description of the goods that you are shipping. You need to provide a goods description on all shipping documents like the airway bill and the commercial invoice. You should also include it on any other additional documents required by the authorities. A clear description gives customs authorities the information they need to assess taxes and duties. It's also necessary to check if your goods are allowed to enter the country, and you can do that based on the goods description and the HS classification. Question two, what detail do I need to provide? Ask yourselves these questions when describing your goods. What are the goods? What are they made of? And what are they used for? The description should be specific, not vague. And if the package contains branded items, please include the brand and model number along with the description. Don't just rely on the company product code to describe the goods. Let me give you an example of why these questions, what is it, what is it made for, what's its purpose, what does it do, 
are important. Here we see the example of a toothbrush. A toothbrush can be a general old fashioned toothbrush, can be electric, or it can be also a repaired electric toothbrush. That results in different customs descriptions and also depending on the characteristics, you will come to a different classification. So let us end this tips and tricks section with the next slide where we give here some examples of how to provide a correct goods descriptions. General descriptions like phone, clothes, gifts, accessories, samples will not be accepted. They would need additional specification with the consequence of possible delays uh, with your shipment. Last but not least, use the UPS tools like UPS Tradeability, which you'll find at ups.com or use government websites. The EU has one, uh, Customs and Border House Protection has one. Use these sites to determine your six digit HS code. The second item that we will need to provide is the EORI number. The requirement is to provide the EORI number of the importer when it is available. And EORI stands for the Economic Operators Registration and Identification Number. It is the identification, the ID of the importer with customs. In the EU, Businesses and people wishing to trade must use the EORI number as an identification number in all customs procedures when exchanging information with the customs administrations. Your importer will need to request an EORI number through his local customs website. And here on the slide, you see some links to the national government's websites where that can be done. You will need to provide us with the importer's EORI number. If not, your goods will not be cleared through customs. We will, of course, to halt your shipment uh, until we can supply the data, which could mean significant delays and additional charges, which we want to avoid. The EU Commission has published a document that provides information on the national implementation of EORI, including the authorities responsible for assigning an EORI number, the national procedures for assigning an EORI number, the documents to be provided during the registration process, and some useful links. Let's now turn into the VAT. The value added tax in the European Union or VAT is a general broadly based consumption tax assessed on the value added to goods and services. It applies more or less to all goods and services that are bought and sold for use or consumption in the European Union. And we need to process the VAT when shipments are coming into the European Union through the customs declaration. Over the past years, however, the European Court of Auditors have found that large amounts of VAT have been avoided through criminal acts. And that is why the EU came, uh, Commission came up with a plan to reform the EU VAT system. On the 1st of July, 2021, the import one-stop shop, IOSS, was introduced. The ISSS allows suppliers and e-commerce platforms selling imported goods to buyers in the EU to collect, declare, and pay the VAT to the tax authorities instead of making the buyer pay the VAT at the moment the goods are imported into the EU. It's obvious that this is going to help and is helping e-commerce. If the seller is not registered in the ISSS, the buyer has to pay 
the VAT directly on importation, and that's the way it used to be. In the first six months after this deployment, member states were able to collect around 1.9 billion in VAT revenues, translating to 3.8 billion annually. 690 million in extra revenues were related to parcels valued at less than 22 euro. That is important because under the previous VAT regime, goods with a real value of over 22 euro were frequently undervalued to avail of a special VAT exemption. And of course, prior to this, goods below 22 euro were exempt of import VAT. Over 8,000 traders have registered for the electronic portal, the import one-stop shop. And overall, EU customs handle around 500 million items covered by, by the new simplified data set in the six months from July 2021, with 94% of them supplied by ISSS registered traders. It's obvious that the EU Commission looks at this as being a big success. And they are now looking at future changes, like, for instance, making the ISS scheme mandatory for business to consumer transactions and increasing the current scope of 150 euro to a higher value. Let's now switch to the UK and Northern Ireland. When the UK and the EU separated, a lot of rules had to change because the UK and Northern Ireland were fully integrated with the EU customs union and the single market. This required many changes and these changes have been agreed in a trade agreement. For Northern Ireland, special rules needed to be created since both parties wanted to avoid a hard physical customs border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And therefore, the Northern Ireland protocol was adopted. In order to minimize the impact on trade, the UK plans to phase in specific controls. The UK government has postponed the full implementation of these controls already a couple of times because they want to avoid friction to trade, particularly at Eurotunnel and at the ferry ports. For clarity, the controls that are no longer being introduced for EU goods in July 2022 are a requirement for sanitary and phytosanitary SPS checks currently at destination to be moved to a border control post, the BCP, a requirement for safety and security as an S declarations, a requirement for a health certification for further SPS imports and a requirement for SPS goods to be presented at a BCP, a border control point. This is true for movements from the EU into the UK the other way around, movements from the uh, UK to the EU, all controls apply since the 1st of January 2021. Let's talk about Northern Ireland, uh, uh, which is a bit the hot potato for the moment. Uh, also there, we are still in a uh, transition period, which means that declarations will only usually be required where the goods are either prohibited or restricted, or for business to business transactions where the values are higher than 135 GB pounds. And also, a separate ERI number or EORI number may be needed when moving goods to Northern Ireland. The EORI number starts with GB to move goods to Great Britain and starts with XI for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland based businesses receiving goods from the UK valued over 135 GB pounds have to submit a declaration. However, they can delay this and they will be able to use the free trader support service to do so, the TSS. 
but moving goods between the EU and Northern Ireland, those movements are considered intra-European movements and in free circulation with no requirement for customs paperwork. So this ends my overview on current developments. And now I hand it over to Ron and Penny, who will provide you with information on sanctions, the situation in Ukraine, and the foreign direct product rule. Over to you, Ron. Thank you, Walter. And thanks for a great update on uh, a lot of the things going on in Europe. Um, no European trade compliance update would uh, be complete without an update on the sanctions uh, and the different developments going on in the Ukraine and the crisis there. And so that's uh, what I'm going to, to provide everyone for today. And, and thank you all for joining. So recently, the EU Commission has, has enacted and proposed sanctions uh, against Russia, um, basically trying to put as much pressure as possible financially on Russia to change their behavior as they can. And they're, they're joining uh, countries all over the world in, in applying these types of sanctions and, and export controls and import controls similar to Canada and, and mostly the United States, which has very robust sanctions uh, and different controls in place uh, to try and change behavior there. So more recently within the European Commission, they've um, banned, as you can imagine, coal uh, imports into, the, into Europe, which puts pressure on uh, those resources that Russia is exporting to the European Union. Uh, they're also proposing uh, and close to uh, looking at an agreement where they're going to be banning oil, crude oil imports and, and then ultimately uh, finished uh, fuels, which uh, would have a major impact on the European community or uh, European uh, economy as well as in, in, in Russia as well. But those different sanctions and, and controls are in place to try and put as much pressure as possible on Russia. And as you can see with the sanctions, there are commodity-based restrictions for importing into the EU, and there's also entity-based uh, sanctions. So going after banks and different other high-level people within the Russian government are being placed on sanctions so that it's preventing them from being able to move uh, their financial assets uh, around the world, restricting them to do that. Again, trying to impose as much pressure as possible to try to change the behavior that's going on with Russia in the Ukraine. So let's turn, let's turn these different things that we have going on with the EU, uh, which are just additional sanctions that are being applied to Russia in addition to Canada, but also in the United States, Let's take a look at some different uh, additions that the United States is going on as well, most notably to the uh, foreign direct product rule. So we can go to the next slide. So the United States, as many people is aware, uh, aware of, and we won't get into great detail here, has applied sanctions for the last uh, few months to Russia and Belarus with, I'll, I'm gonna categorize them in two major fun, uh, functions or groups. So one is sanctions-based um, restrictions on entities where they're looking at financial and assets of the Russian government, as well as Russian um, dignitaries and high-level people within the government to prevent them from being able to um, take advantage of the situation uh, that the Russian government is, is, is in with respect to Ukraine. So. Those sanctions are against the entities. Now, how do we, how do other countries affect change or put pressure on the Russian and Belarus government is to also look at their ability to generate funds. So the way you generate funds is by you sell things to the rest of the world and, and you get their, that capital. So if you prevent their ability to do that with respect to um, sanctions or commodity controls that disallow products to be either exported to Russia or exported from Russia into your, into your economy, then you're preventing that type of capital influx uh, into Russia, which then 
ultimately, uh, which many governments believe, if you prevent the flow of capital into a country, they can't use that capital to do nefarious and bad things uh, that you want them to you want to prevent them to do. So, as it relates to the recent U.S. sanctions, they had added additional entities to it, and they're adding additional commodities. So let's talk about foreign direct product rule. So as, as occurred in August of 2020, when uh, the United States adapted measures to prevent uh, Huawei, Chinese telecommunications company, uh, which they saw as um, having um, certain issues uh, that were national security issues with respect to US telecommunications industry, those measures on their foreign direct product will have now being applied to Russia as well. And so what does that mean? So the export administration regulations determine what products can be exported to certain countries, in this case, Russia, and how much of those, or, or whether or not it requires a license to be able to export. And then what are those products in terms of the makeup mean in terms of what is under US jurisdiction or US law. As many of you probably are aware of, when you talk about importing a product into a country, the country of origin will determine the type of duty or other types of regulations that apply to bringing that product into that country. So when you look at the foreign direct product rule, not only you're looking at the country of origin, but the country of origin now from a foreign direct product rule actually goes very deep into the supply chain. So any product manufactured anywhere in the world that contains US technology, software, or, or other types of apparatus that help create that product is subject to the US Export Administration regulations. And when you then now classify that, so look how far deep in the supply chain, if you're exporting something to Russia somewhere in the world, so not from the US certainly, but anywhere in the world, if you're exporting something that could ultimately end up in Russia, if that product contains anything that was, was manufactured or created with US technology or software or other types of apparatus, it's now subject to the EAR. And when you look at subject to the EAR, you have to then take a look at, okay, well then what are the requirements for the material that's now subject to the US EAR, even though it may have been assembled, manufactured somewhere else in the world, it could be subject to the EAR. So now you're taking a look at with that product and, and mostly we're looking at items that are on the EAR or the commodity classification, commerce classification list starting with three and above. When you look at those, uh, you know, it's electronics, it's uh, different types of uh, apparatus or parts, uh, things that would be used in the aeronautics, marine industries, all those types of things. When you look at those, would they require a license to ship? And the, the US, uh, the Bureau of Industry and Security has issued a notice saying that we're basically going to default of a denied uh, list, uh, denied license, or not. Been, you, we're not going to automatically say that you're eligible for a license for this. You have to prove. Uh, why the, your product wouldn't be subject to the, uh, the CCL or the EAR. So once you do that, or you look at your supply chain of all the materials that you have going into the product, are any of them manufactured with some type of, of software or technology or other types of things that are subject or manufactured in the United States? There's an awful lot of things that are out there uh, that would fall into this. So that pretty much prevents your ability to do that. So how do you stay out of trouble? You got to look at what are all the things and components that go into your products and, you know, where are they manufactured? How, how did they come to be? Where were the designs done? All that stuff. And then, you know, apply that and making sure that you understand, you know, very deep into your supply chain where these things come from. The second part would be understanding what are the sanctions that your country would have in place uh, against Russia and whether or not the products or the, even this, the export of your products to that country would apply. And kind of getting back to one of the things that uh, was in the previous slide, but I'll mention it here now. If the European Union has also applied uh, controls on products that are being shipped through the EU, ultimately to Russia as well. So 
it's very difficult to try and get material uh, into Russia. You have to look at what type of uh, compliance concerns you're bringing your organization under by entertaining um, exporting material to Russia or even the controls that you have in place to oversee all of your business units around the world, right? So if you're a global organization, you have different buyers all over the world. You have people that could want to buy stuff from you in one country, but then ultimately have to or would ship those products to Russia. So certainly have to know who your buyers are, what their intended use is, and that's all part of your responsibility as an exporter for products uh, that you're shipping throughout the world. So I think now I'm gonna turn it over to Penny. Thanks, Ron. And I think um, there was a question in the chat. Somebody asked about how effective this foreign direct product rule has been to date. Well, at UPS, we're very focused on the situation in Ukraine, um, and we've been extremely focused on our people. We've been checking in with our people in Ukraine every day. Um, many of them are still in Ukraine, um, and all, all are safe at, uh, as of our last check. So the safety of our people has been our number one priority. We have suspended our service in Ukraine, as well as in Russia and Belarus, in part because of the complexities of some of the customs rules, but now looking at some of the complexities around providing safe transport and continuing to protect the safety of our people. We're continuing to closely monitor the situation and we'll look at um, service um, in the near future. We are doing um, some very limited humanitarian movements, um, particularly into Ukraine. Um, so um, that is where things stand with Ukraine. I do wanna answer the one question somebody asked about how effective the foreign direct product rule had been. So, um, and where it is, it, it, it introduces a complexity to your exports into Russia. And I think based on Ron's description, you can understand the complexities and how difficult and challenging it is to assess if your product's going to be compliant. And what we have seen is that um, we have not, one of the things the US was trying to do was to ensure globally that people were not shipping in technologies that had potentially dual uses. And they expanded that description based on the products they identified on the list. And um, if you look at or speak to some of the security officials, they'll tell you that they believe it has been effective in terms of the intent, which was to prevent uh, certain spare parts or other goods from uh, being shipped into Russia to provide repairs or to be used in the war. So that is the situation in, um, that we have currently at the moment in Ukraine, as well as in Russia and Belarus. Next slide. Back to you, Walter. Thank you, Penny. So let's talk about the wise persons group. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about the wise persons group for two reasons. And the first one is I've been dealing with customs for more than 38 years now. And to put that a bit in uh, uh, perspective, that was the period that disruptive technology came in. Uh, at that time, the fax machine replaced the telex. So I have seen in the meantime, a lot of changes to customs legislation in different countries. And the proposals from the wise persons group uh, bring customs legislation to a new level. And the second reason why I'm very enthusiastic about the wise persons group is that I sincerely believe that customs play an important role for society, not only to facilitate trade, but also in a way make this a better world or a safer world. Look at the role of customs that they are currently uh, developing with human rights, sustainability, product safety. Now, you have to put the work of the wise persons group into perspective. The customs legislation in the European Union was conceived in the beginning of this century. Plans were developed to simplify, standardize and modernize the rules, which was an ambitious exercise, which resulted 
in the Union Customs Code implemented in 2016. However, that implementation is still ongoing and should be finished by 2025. The reason for that slow progress is that the Commission, the member states and trade have to change many IT system, I would say too many IT systems. In the same time, the Commission realized that the objectives of the UCC were not realized. It saw the need to reflect on the current status and to come up with an alternative plan for the future. To that end, the Wise Persons Group was created. The Wise Persons Group was an independent high level group comprised of members from politics, industry, traders, and academia. And it was headed by the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union, and Cooperation of Spain, Professor Aranja Gonzalez Laya. The European Commission invited this group to reflect on the challenges facing customs today, examine current rules, procedures, and governance, and consider how these could be improved. The Wise Persons Group prepared its report in full independence based on the terms of reference agreed with the member states customs administration and they focused on four priority areas e-commerce risk management effective management of customs increasing range of non-financial tasks and future government structure now the wise persons group has come up with a package of reform proposals relating to processes, responsibilities, liabilities, and governments of European customs. A new approach to data that diminishes reliance on customs declarations, that focuses on obtaining better quality data from commercial sources and provides business with a single data entry point for customs formalities. The last advocacy is for a comprehensive framework for cooperation, including data sharing between European customs, but also with market surveillance authorities, law enforcement bodies, and tax authorities for a comprehensive management of risks at EU level. They have come up with a timeline for implementing 10 recommendations, and they have advised to use the existing budget of 1 billion euro. They expect to generate a revenue of 1.5 billion and recommend an implementation timeline between 2023 and 2030. Now, we all need to look into these proposals into more detail, work between trade and European Commission, because not everything will be self-evident to implement, but it is important to understand what the next steps are. The EU Commission will review this report, take into consideration also uh, evaluation of the Union Customs Code, and also the European Court of Auditors report on customs rules. And its objectives are to revise the EU customs legislation and the governance, to modernize the customs rules for security and integrity of the single market to facilitate legitimate trade and increase synergies with customs and other authorities. We will continue to keep you informed about further developments. And with this, I hand it over to Penny, who will now cover global trade trends. Thank you, Walter. So um, I think there's been a lot of really fantastic information that Walter and Ron have shared with regards to some very specific things going on. And I think it's really important. The world at the moment is incredibly complex, incredibly unpredictable. And it's really important to do what you can with the things that are within your own control. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's coming up that we just don't, we just can't predict. By following some of the advice that Ron and Walter have offered today, it provides you with a, a fantastic foundation with regards to how to ensure that you're doing everything within your power to continue to move goods within your supply chain and to move goods within your business. So um, moving to the next slide, 
one thing I just wanted to touch on. I just have two things here, I think, uh, to bring us home today. Um, first is, is what's really going on with global trade? So there's a lot of discussion out in the media that, you know, international trade is dead and globalization is dead. Larry Fink from BlackRock put out a piece saying globalization is dead. But one thing that we've seen is, is that trade is continuing to grow. It grew almost 9% uh, last year. And um, we continue to see trade flow despite ships getting stuck in the Suez Canal, despite zero COVID in the port of Shanghai, trade in, is continuing. And it's important to also understand that that trade is largely based on the World Trade Organization rules. So European trade, US trade, almost 99% of that trade is done on WTO rules. And that provides a foundation that's predictable, that's certain, that creates stability in a system that at times has been a little unstable. There have been hiccups over the past couple of years. There were some export controls put into effect with regards to certain essential goods by certain countries, but largely those have all been lifted at this stage and international trade remains robust and resilient. But there is stress in the system, a lot of it political. Uh, shocks have still not dissipated. And I think it's important for everybody to remember that um, um, while trade continues, there is the possibility for disruptions and building in some resilience into your, into your supply chains and into how you're thinking about trade is really important. Next slide. One other trend that we just wanted to touch upon today, and it builds off of what Ron was saying with regards to the foreign direct product rule. And this is around supply chain transparency. So again, trade has been largely resilient and things have been moving. There have been shortages, primarily on the manufacturing side, a few things that have been um, problematic due to port capacities and sometimes COVID disruptions. But the other trend that we're seeing in, in a lot of jurisdictions around the world is that authorities want businesses to understand and be transparent about their supply chains. And that is going back to Ron's foreign direct product rule, understanding all the components that are within your products. And if any of them are sensitive or um, covered by any of these new export control rules, it's looking at what are your suppliers doing? So we have rules out there in both the EU and in other jurisdictions looking at labor. Uh, is the labor that's producing your goods uh, being forced to work or are they, and are they well paid, well treated? Additionally, climate change. People wanna know that, that your suppliers and that you understand what your suppliers are doing in your supply chain with regards to climate change. So these are some of the things that we're looking at. It, it has become important for supply chain resilience that people understood where their goods were coming from, not just by country, but by city or locale, particularly as COVID restrictions went into a place on city by city levels in certain countries. And just to say that this is a trend that we see and that we think will continue moving forward and is something that's important to keep an eye on as you think about your sourcing patterns and your supply chains and, and how you're going to demonstrate and comply with some of these new requirements that are coming into effect. So with that, um, Natalie, I turn it back over to you. And I think we're happy to take any questions at this stage. Yes, thank you so much, Penny. Uh, yes, if there are anyone who has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A function and we'll um, answer them as they come in. Uh, while we're waiting, though, for uh, people to put in questions, Walter, I, I had a question um, just related to ICS2. Um, could you clarify what information do manufacturers, exporters, um, and individuals outside um, EU that are shipping goods into the EU have to provide? Well, basically, uh, an accurate goods description, and we covered that subject in the beginning of this webinar. Uh, remember uh, the criteria that we have provided. What, what is it? What does it do? 
what is it composed of, uh, then a harmonized tariff code, and you can find that on ups.com through UPS tradeability or on the websites of uh, uh, the Customs and Border House Protection or the EU Commission, and an importer EORI number if you're shipping to a business. Awesome. Thank you so much, Walter. Um, also on that note, regarding uh, e-commerce business, how can e-commerce businesses uh, get a green lane uh, for their customer experience? Well, the, the, the answer here is you, you have to register for ISSS for a couple of reasons. And I'm, I'm first going to cover uh, the fact uh, that, that ISSS allows you uh, the VAT assessment at checkout. Uh, when your customer pays the, uh, uh, the VAT uh, included into the transaction, uh, the ISSS ID can be used in the downstream clearance process uh, and uh, the settlement of taxes follows at a periodic stage. So um, this is also a, a good advantage for you. You do not pay your VAT transactionally, but you do it in the next month, uh, consolidated. And also uh, think about the transparency uh, for your, your consignee, for your customer. He is not going to be bothered uh, with paying import VAT. No, no. He is going to see the complete price into your product. So it's one transaction. It's a smoothless uh, transaction. Awesome. Thanks so much, Walter. Um, and we did get one question in. Um, this is in regards to the wise persons group. Uh, what next steps can be envisaged after the publication of the WPG report? So the, the uh, European Commission, DG Taxit, is now uh, reviewing the uh, wise persons uh, group report, which is an extensive uh, report. Um, they will now uh, prepare by the end of the year uh, legislation. Uh, we, as uh, UPS, as part of the trade associations, will be involved into the discussion on, on how this will need to be uh, uh, translated into uh, uh, legislation because uh, not every uh, proposal is as realistic as it uh, can be. And I think that is the role of trade, of legitimate trade, of course, um, that is to work with government stakeholders to ensure that new legislation also can be effectively implemented. So we expect to have further updates throughout the year and then see a proposal that then will need to be adopted by the European Council and the European Parliament. And that will result in new legislation that will start to become into effect in 2023. Awesome. Uh, and another quick question for you. Do the uh, descriptions of your goods on the commercial invoices need to be in the local language for customs or can they be in English? And are there any countries that uh, description in local language is compulsory? Yes, unfortunately, the EU um, has 27 member states. It has 23 different languages. And of course, your invoice can be in English. And uh, in a lot of countries, uh, that will be accepted. Uh, uh, of course, there's no issue in, in Ireland. But we can say also in, uh, um, in the northern part of uh, uh, the EU, uh, thinking about uh, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, that's not going to be an issue. It could be more challenging into uh, the former or, or the, the central European countries or in the southern countries. You can have your, your you're allowed to put your description into uh, a plain English language, but then in some cases, UPS will need to translate this into the local language. And also it could be if customs ask for more documentation like a, a tariff catalog, uh, then uh, uh, it will require us, UPS, to translate uh, that into the local language. That, of course, is also something that we are uh, trying to change, having uh, English uh, as the uh, standard language 
used for customs declarations into uh, the EU. Thank you so much, Walter. Well, great. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining in on the Facilitating European Trade and Compliance webinar today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, the emails listed on the screen. If you have any webinar specific questions, feel free to reach out to myself, Natalie Warren. Um, you will be getting this recording as well as this presentation in a uh, post webinar email, so be on the lookout for that. And there will also be a post webinar survey uh, following the webinar. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us and hope you have a great rest of your day.